morning. It's so good to be with you. Uh, uh, like Carla said, this is the first of five weeks when we're focused on, on this um, Living Intention series. And today, my primary focus is um, parents living in tension. And uh, this topic has the potential for many of us to be uh, pain-filled and difficult uh, because a lot of us would feel like we've made mistakes in our parenting in years back, and those mistakes um, still haunt our relationship with our children and others in our family. And we live in a broken world where relationships within families are not what God originally intended or planned for, and therefore they're often characterized uh, uh, by unresolved tensions that have gone on for years, and then we need to walk in that. And having just concluded the holidays, I was thinking this morning, it's probable that some of these tensions have surfaced again during the holidays, and that this is a sensitive time for some of you. Some of you uh, uh, need to take a breath and um, give yourself lots of grace as you're listening to the things that God might be whispering to you this morning. And I hope you'll use gentleness and respect uh, on yourself. So let me start this way. Um, here's what I used to think in my younger days that spiritual maturity was. Spiritual maturity in my younger days was knowing for certain the right answers to important questions and being able to advise others of those answers. It makes sense, right? That's the way public schools work. The teachers know the answers. They give the answers to the students, and the students grow. And um, parents could think that, like, I'm the parent, I know the answers, and I simply got to tell my kids the answers. And that uh, mature people help less mature people. Smart people help less smart people. Um, that's how spiritual maturity works. But... Um, uh, as we put an X through that, I want to tell you that is not spiritual maturity. Uh, bummer. Now, <laughs> I realize as a follower of Jesus, I had an immature answer for what spiritual maturity was. It's not just about knowledge. It's not just about knowing stuff and passing that knowledge on. It's not just about advice giving. Um, uh, most of following Jesus is not about only having the right answer. In fact, in our spiritual growth stages, one through six that we teach here often, the only stage that increases knowledge is stage one. So if you're stuck in stage one, you have so much to go. So now here's the definition we're bringing uh, now. Spiritual maturity is living and loving intention with others who think and believe and live differently than I do. And this is really important. Trusting God for outcomes in their lives, in their relationships, and in their lives. The key words in the definition are living and loving intention. And boy, this is important for parents. Living and loving intention and trusting God. Spiritual maturity comes when I realize I do not control other people, including my children as they grow up. Well, I, re I control them as infants as I need to. They need to learn to obey. But as they hit middle school and high school and college and young adulthood, my control over them becomes less and less and less. And I need to, in tension, become comfortable with that. People have their own journeys with God. And God's timing in their life is not my timing. And that includes my children. God knows best, and he cares and loves for my kids. So, uh, story. I'm a second-generation wrestler. Second, my dad was a wrestler. He wrestled in high school, a little in college. I wrestled in junior high, high school, and a year of college. Um, wrestling was important. My brothers wrestled. It was a part of our family. If you were in the Bartlett family, wrestling was a big deal. Um, my sons did not wrestle. In fact, I also coached wrestling in high school because of what it meant to me. But my sons didn't wrestle. Well, Ben, my second son, he actually wrestled for three days uh, in junior high. And then he jammed his thumb. And he came home, and we sat down. And all, almost all parents of middle school kids have had this experience. I don't want to wrestle anymore. My thumb hurts. I didn't like it. Uh, it's not my deal. I want to quit. Okay, now as a parent, right, I have tension. Like, I don't want to raise a house full of quitters. Um, sometimes when you start something, you should finish something. And so we talked it over, and we're in that tension, right? God knows what's best, but I don't think I know what's best. And so we were trying to decide, and we left it up to Ben to decide. 
three days of wrestling, he quit. I thought he made a poor choice. Nine years later, I'm invited to Wartburg College to Ben's senior piano recital. I have not been tracking with Ben's piano playing at all. I'm not a music guy, if you haven't noticed. Um, I went to his recital, and I was blown away. I watched his fingers move over that keyboard, and as a wrestling coach, I was thinking, I'm glad he quit wrestling. I don't want those thumbs jammed. I don't want those fingers broken. I don't want them to look like my fingers do. And nine years later, I saw he made the right decision for him. Now, here's the tension we have as parents. The answer that worked for me didn't work for Ben. He was doing something different. God had gifted him in different ways. And I didn't even know what it was. If you'd have come to me when Ben was 12 and said, what's he good at? I might not have even known music. God was leading Ben in ways that I had no clue. And as I need to live in the tension of that. We can learn so much by looking closely at the life of Jesus because he was perfectly okay with living in tension. Now, you probably wouldn't say that's a characteristic of Jesus that you think about. Well, Jesus lived in lots of tension. But the Bible, if you look at it with this lens, you see he lived in all kinds of tension and he was a mature Christian. He was the lead Christian. And if he lived in tension, we ought to realize we're going to live in tension as we follow him. So here's my first example. It's from the book of Mark. Here's Jesus' life. Uh, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, four of his disciples, ask Jesus privately, hey, tell us when these things will happen. And what will be the sign that they're all about to be fulfilled? They're asking him about the end of the world. When's the end of the world going to come? And how's it going to happen and all that? And then Jesus gives the answers he knows for 27 verses, and then here's the next verse, the 28th verse, he's answering the question. But about that day or that hour, nobody really knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor, Jesus says, the Son, which is me. Jesus says, I don't even know, but who knows? Only the Father. Jesus could tell his disciples what he knew, but there was a whole bunch he didn't know, and he had to live with not knowing the answer. And there are several places in the New Testament where Jesus said, I don't know this one. I don't know this one. Jesus lived in tension as he walked with his disciples. Any, Carla said, any human relationship on earth is going to have tension. Well, Jesus sure had it with the guys. The disciples tried to send the kids away, and Jesus said, no, 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 you got it wrong. Let the kids come to me, because unless you have faith like a child, what? You don't even belong in the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples tried to argue among themselves who had the most honored place in heaven. You know, who gets to be on his right and who gets to be on his left? And Jesus had to answer them and say, hey, it's not my place to determine it. I don't even know who will be on my right or left. Who will be on my right will be determined by, again, I don't have the answer, my father. They tried to send hungry people away, and Jesus said, no, 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 let's feed them. What do we have? A few loaves and fish. When they were in the boat, Jesus was asleep in the front in the storm, and a big storm came up, and what did they do? They went to the front, they woke Jesus up and said, we're going to die. And he said, how long do you have to follow me before you trust me? In the upper room, when he's teaching them about communion, and they're having the, the first last supper, uh, and he's passing the bread and the cup, and he's saying, whoa, this one's going to betray me, this one's going to deny me, and these are going to forsake me. Can you feel the tension in that? That's almost like a holiday celebration with a family that doesn't get along. There's tension in that. And the most tense place that I often think about is uh, the next verse I want to bring to you. Um, this is after the Last Supper, and Jesus takes the disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he has them wait by the gate, and he goes in farther to pray, and here's what he prays. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet, not my will, but yours be done. Do you hear the tension and agony in that? So much agony that heaven sends an angel. 
An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. But look at the next verse. Even after the angel was there ministering and helping and encouraging him, what does he do? And being in even more anguish, in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And he had a physical manifestation, sweat like drops of blood falling to the ground. If you've ever been under great, great stress, you know it affects your body. Jesus was in incredible tension. Incredible tension. Um, Notice... Uh, serious inner tension. And Jesus taught about tension. He taught, a lot of his teaching was about tension. I'm just going to bring up one real quick. This is from Matthew. And it's part of the Sermon on the Mount. He simply says, Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? I see something wrong in your life. I can't help it. I just keep seeing it. It's there. And what does Jesus say? Live in the tension because you have a plank in your own. That's tension. And uh, here's my favorite uh, parenting verse and then some more stories. Here's an important. Carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Now wait. Carry each other's burdens, but each one should carry their own load and don't judge each other. Don't compare. I mean, that verse right there is a parenting series. Like crazy. What's a burden and what's a load? What's a burden I should help my kid with? What's a load that they ought to carry on their own in order to grow up? And how do I not compare my four kids? How do I not? Wow. This, this, this takes God to help us with this. A lot. Don't compare each other. And figure out, and, and even mom and dad talking... If you have a mom and dad in your family, mom and dad talking and saying, is this a load that they ought to get under and carry themselves, or is this a burden? I remember getting a phone call uh, about 2 a.m. from my son, Joel. And he said, uh, the phone, cell phone, uh, Dad, uh, I need some help. Can you come help me? 2 a.m. I'm kind of trying to wake up. You know how that is? And he goes, I've been in an accident on 380, and uh, I need you to come. I said, well, we'll come. We'll get in the car and we'll come. And uh, tension. And he said, oh, by the way, Dad, when you see me, don't be shocked. My face is messed up. So we end up at a quick trip, come and go kind of place on 380. And uh, I walk in and he's with a highway patrolman. And he's got a huge swelling black eye and his face is all bloody. And the cop grabs me and he says, uh, we hope you'll press charges. Because the story was Joel had been working on a contact and he ran into a, a guy who, uh, two guys who were changing a tire. So he hit that car and they were changing a tire. And uh, one of the guys got real mad and came back and wonked him a couple times. And so I've got the policeman saying, the highway patrolman saying, we hope you'll, and I look at Joel and say, what do you need, Joel? Because to me, this was a burden. This was not a load. This was a burden, a crushing burden. And he said, Dad, what I want to do is go home. I don't want to press charges. I want to go home. And so, again, parents live in this tension, right? You live in a tension. It's like, what's the right thing to do here? Should I help Joel press charges? Shall I let him drive home? Uh, and he said, I'm not driving anywhere. So I drove his truck home, and uh, we, we put him to bed. And the kicker is not all of the stress and tension comes within your family. Sometimes the stress and tension comes from others who are trying to put it on you in your family. So Jeremy graduated from college with a business finance degree. And what he wanted to do was take a rest. And so he was delivering pizzas. Uh, college finance degree, did I say that? He was delivering pizzas for like six or eight months. And I would ask him, Jerry, what's going on? I'm resting. I'm going to get a job, but I'm not ready yet. And so I was fine with that, right? Tension. But 
some friends I respected a lot, a lot. And a couple of them, even in this church, came to me and said, you need to push him out of the nest right now. Well, one, what are they telling me what to do for? And two, what do they know about me and Jair? But you know what they knew? They knew their story. They knew how their life went. They knew how their nest worked. And so some of the tension we live with, right, are, um, are caused by other times. And parents deal with this all the time, outside opinions of people that want to give you. Um, how old should your kid be when you give them a phone? How do you handle a social distancing as a family in the pandemic? How much screen time is right? Everybody has opinions. How hard do you push uh, your kid's involvement in church or youth group or Sunday morning? How much do you help them with college costs? Everybody's got opinions, and some of that can cause stress. But w w what I want to see is stress is just a part of being a mature parent. And so sometimes you just have to shuck off that and deal with what's right for you. Alice did a really good teaching last week. I agree. It was an introduction to this series, even though it was the closing one for the previous one. I told her, I called her, I said, Alice, those two slides on what tension looks like, living in tension looks like, are so good, I want to put them in my teaching. She said, oh, good. Then maybe people will remember them. So here's Alice's slides with one addition. And here's what she said last week. Now, I want you to think of it in terms of parenting. Okay, not needing all the answers. A parent doesn't need all the answers. Even Jesus didn't get all the answers. So you don't need all the answers. Not now and sometimes not ever. Stick with your commitments. And Alice said on this one, um, especially when it gets hard. So you made a commitment to one of your child. You made a commitment to each other within your family. As best you can, stick with those commitments. Here's a hard one for some. Acknowledge I might be wrong or I might be half wrong. I might have been wrong on a whole bunch of things raising my kids. I was wrong on some of them. We used to give Christmas gifts trying to uh, uh, fan a flame of a gift they had. Always wrong. Give the chemistry set to the kid who hated chemistry. Give the mechanical set, not to the kid who's going to uh, be a mechanical engineer. Uh, give it to the finance guy. I mean, just wrong, because you, you're not, you don't know the answers. You don't know what God is doing in each kid. Hold on to multiple truths at the same time. Two things are true at the same time. I don't want to raise quitters, and maybe I should let Ben quit. Right? Hold on to truths at the same time. That's tough. That's tough. That's living with uncertainty. Let's go to the next page. Allowing cherished ideas to be challenged. This, this, this is a tough one in a family. Allowing cherished ideas to be challenged, because kids will do that. They will take your ideas that are so important to you, and they'll push on it, especially in middle school, as I remember. It's like, whoa. Um, be open to mystery. What's God doing? Living without resolution. Living in the gray. Giving away the last word. You ought to actually try this. It's actually fun. I've been doing it for a couple months. I, I read that this was what love was. Give away the last word. So I'll be in an animated discussion, and then... When, when the other person makes a good last word, I'll just go. It's really nice speaking with you. And just be done. You don't have to one-up people all the time. You don't have to get the last word. And then this is one I added. Uh, waiting to be asked. As your kids grow through stages, the older they get, the more you should wait to be asked. And... Um, let them ask me when they need help. Let them ask me when they have a question. And if you're building the right relationship with them, they will ask. They will. Okay, so um, when, uh, when our kids are younger, um, we need to teach them who's in charge. So some of what I've just said here doesn't uh, 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 impact raising infants. Somebody has to teach infants who's in charge, and that's their parents, and then eventually God and if they don't learn their parents are in charge, then they'll probably never learn that God's in charge. Uh, so we need to teach them. And if we don't teach them that lesson, you know, infants through elementary uh, in there, they need to know. 
Mom and dad are in charge. But then in middle school, uh, we begin a new process, which is negotiating. Uh, we don't just uh, tell them things, because I'm in charge now. Now we begin to negotiate. It's like, oh, what do you think? What do I think? How do we decide? Now, you still have the car keys, and you still have the billfold and the money. So it's like, you're still in charge, but some negotiation really helps here. And then in high school and college, we need to start letting go, which, talk about tension. Letting go, letting go. We need to understand their journey will look different than ours, and I want to say a word about their journey of faith will look different than ours. Every one of my children had a unique journey of faith that didn't look like mine or their brothers or their sister, and that's good. That is actually how, people, how God works in people's lives. He works uniquely in each life. Some people need a time out for several years before they re-engage with God because they've been brought to church forever and they just need a time out. And as a parent, if I don't understand, that could be God at work. I could, I could really destroy a relationship. Sometimes people need um, to push back strongly away from their parents' faith. That's just a part of how they're made. So you've had faith in Jesus. I may end up with faith in Jesus, but right now I need to push away from that. Some people need to ask a ton of questions. Some people are more compliant and they just, faith is just step by step by step, never have to push away, never have to ask a lot of hard questions. It's just step by step by step. And we need to surrender to God with our kids and trust that he's at work in them in ways we might not even see right now. (sighs) Tension. There's a lot of it. Jesus had it. It can be tough. We need to find celebrations in who God made our kids to be, and I guarantee you this. There are 10 things in each of your kids right now that you could celebrate. More than 10 important things. And sometimes, as a youth director or a parent, I had to push people past seeing today's problems and today's challenges to see the amazing good things going on. Uh, my mom loved me her entire life. Uh, She's gone now, but her incredible, unconditional love, now that I look back, really freed me to serve and risk and love. She loved me so much. I I was living out of town an hour and a half away with my kids, and I would get to town every four or five, six weeks, and once in a while, my work would bring me to town, and I would just stop in and surprise my mom and dad, and they would sit down at the table, And my mom would say, I was hoping you would drop in. I haven't been there for five weeks. And when I made these brownies, I left this end free of nuts. So in case you dropped in, you could have a nut-free brownie. Because I I don't really like nuts and brownies. And I looked at my dad, who likes nuts and brownies. I thought, man, everybody's sacrificing because my mom loves me. Just that kind of love, unconditional, Waiting, tension, is important. Let me say one word to grandparents. Uh, Several of the teachers who are becoming grandparents said, Dave, we think you should say a word about grandparents, because I've been a grandparent for 17 years. That's a long time. Uh, And uh, I picture grandparents, my metaphor is grandparents are assistant coaches to their children, who are now the head coaches, raising their grandchildren. So I've been an assistant coach grandparent to my children and grandchildren for 17 years. Assistant coaches are called to bring their best, but to bring it within submission to the head coach, right? I mean, if you're an assistant coach and you run over the head coach, you're going to get fired, right? We all watched some of those games yesterday. This switching of roles can be a tough journey for some. I mean, you've been a head coach in charge calling the shots for many years as you raise your kids, and you've learned a lot, and you probably actually are a better head coach than the current head coach. But this is not your time. This is your time to submit as a grandparent, and that's tension. You might be thinking, I wouldn't do it that way. Doesn't matter. Let me speak to grandparents the assistant coaches, you should bring your very best to the table 
in submission to the desires of your children, the head coaches. Stay within their guidance. If they say no sugar, the answer is no sugar. If they say 8 o'clock bedtime, the answer is 8 o'clock bedtime. If they say don't watch that movie, the answer is don't watch that movie. But bring your best. Uh, grandparent assistant coaches will often find themselves saying, we need to check with your parents about that decision. One day my wife was saying that so often to our oldest grandson then, Charlie. She was saying to Charlie over and over, we got to check with your parents. He wanted to go spend some money at a store. And she said, well, we're not going to do it until we speak with your mom and dad. And he kept asking. She kept giving that answer. And finally, Charlie turned around and he said, Grandma, I think you need to work on your leadership. <laughs> it's kind of weak. <laughs> Let me say to parents, if you have grandparents who love your kids, use their strengths within the bounds you set. Use their best. Let them bring their best resources to your team. Encourage the connection between your kids and parents. Figure out how to use that strength. Uh, Jason, uh, my son-in-law, and Emily, my daughter, have uh, d did an incredible uh, w example of this in that uh, they were doing a confirmation process for their children. Uh, they grew up in, Jason grew up in a church where confirmation was a big deal, and at Orchard, where they attend, uh, we don't have confirmation. So they were doing a confirmation process because that was important to the parents, and they had all these things their kids were doing to be in confirmed in the family. And one of them was using the strength of their four grandparents because they said, you need to make an appointment, take this son or daughter out for supper, and then you need to have spiritual conversations and tell them your journey of faith. So four grandparents sitting down at a table, buying supper at a favorite restaurant, and then sharing their journey of faith. Now that's a great example of using the strengths of your grandparents. And so uh, I would just say... Uh, Use your assistant coaches. So what do you take home from all this rambling? <laughs> Here's what I want you to know. <laughs> Expect as a parent to not have all the answers and to live in tension. Don't be surprised that there's tension. Don't run away from it. Just love your children right in that tension and trust God. He's at work in ways that will surprise you. I'll pray. Uh, dear God, thank you that, oh, for so many things. Thank you for our families. Thank you for our children. Thank you for uh, the love that you just give us for them. Thank you that when Jesus walked on earth, just like us, he lived in tension. He had tension. And he actually modeled how to walk and live in the tension. Father, uh, help us. Help us not run away from tension. Help us not think we have to solve everything right now. Help us not operate out of fear. But uh, Father, help us follow Jesus well love people, all kinds of people, including all kinds of people within our family. In Jesus' name.